ladies and gentlemen, I will turn to Ambassador Liu first. So we just heard Minister Law outline, draw a link between what's happening in Ukraine and something that Taiwan is facing as well. I would like you to go into uh, this, this, this trend of how this dimension of hybrid warfare has also um, been perceived in Taiwan and how has the Taiwanese government been coping with it? Please do. Good morning, uh, distinguished guests and panelists. Uh, let me start by thanking the municipality of Budapest and the CEU uh, Democracy Institute as well as uh, the political capital for organizing this very timely and important um, conference. Um, why Taiwan matters? I think this is the main theme about this panel. Um, despite being a successful democracy, a, a robust economy, and a key player in global market, especially in the chip making industry, as well as a strategic uh, 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 asset in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, regions, um, there's no country in the world other than Taiwan who knows better how to deal with this uh, uh, this uh, military threat and disinformation warfare uh, initiated by a dictatorship. Um, way before the outbreak of the Ukrainian war, uh, in fact, the Chinese uh, government has already launched a uh, hybrid warfare on Taiwan, which combines uh, 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 military harassment and provocation and uh, economic coercion and uh, uh, um, diplomatic oppression, um, spreading fake news, cultivating and collaborating with local agencies, uh, and, and, and as a, as a way to divide and conquer Taiwanese society and to delegitimize Taiwanese government. The ultimate goal, of course, is to unify Taiwan, but I think Beijing's ambition w goes way beyond that goal. Uh, it is to turn Taiwan into the so-called inner sea of China and also as a way to break through the so-called first island chain built by the United States and its Asian uh, security allies. Um, so that's why Beijing's recent uh, military uh, maneuvering uh, on Taiwan uh, has driven the United States, Japan, Korea, Australia, and Philippines crazy. Um, um, on the other hand, Beijing also launched a so-called, what I call the silent invasions into Taiwanese societies. Um, as our minister Law has explained briefly earlier, uh, and I'll get to that point uh, later if I have time to address to you the, uh, the concrete measures adopted by Taiwan's government and Taiwanese society to deal with this. Um, on the military side, I, I just want to share with you that um, even before the outbreak of the Ukrainian war, in, in the year of 2022, every month, this is according to the latest information uh, shared by our Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense, every month, last year, every month, uh, the, the People's Liberation Army launched more than 280 times. One day, uh, one month, sorry, one month uh, last year to penetrate into Taiwan's air defense identification zone and also the middle line of the Taiwan Straits. This year, 2023, the number goes up to 380 times per month. And just September, on September 18, uh, one day, Beijing's uh, uh, Air Force has uh, uh, penetrated uh, the middle line of Taiwan Strait and Taiwan's ADIZ for more than 100 times per day. So things get worse even after the Ukrainian wars. And this is the daily life of Taiwan's people. Uh, um, Taiwan is a free, free society, democratic society, but people are under this uh, constant and daily uh, military and security threat from China. Um, the international response to uh, the Ukrainian war um, further consolidated Taiwan's uh, strategic position in the Indo-Pacific and global market. So US President Joe Biden said four times in public that if China attacks Taiwan, the US will come to Taiwan's help militarily. And Taiwan had received more than just bipartisan support from the US Congress and Senate, but also more and more countries and also international organizations, G20s, G7, and even European uh, Commission, European Parliament have all come up with some statements or resolution highlight the importance of maintaining peace and stability across Taiwan Straits. I don't think they are pointing their finger at Taiwan. Taiwan is not a troublemaker. A troublemaker is from the other side of Taiwan Straits. Um, so, um, Una asked a very good question. How, what is the perception of Taiwanese peoples on this uh, daily uh, and constant uh, security threat from the other side of Taiwan Strait? According to the latest polling in Taiwan, 
60%, 6-0. 60% of Taiwanese people expressing their willingness to defend Taiwan if China attack, attacks uh, the island country. And also, according to the latest poll, it just came out two days ago, by the Eurasia uh, Group Foundation in the US, they survey uh, the average American people about do you support uh, the US government to use force to assist Taiwan if China attacks Taiwan. So again, 60%. 60% of Taiwanese people, according to the Eurasia Group's uh, uh, most recent polling, saying that they, are they will be supported for the US government to use military ways to assist Taiwan if China unilaterally launched the war. So uh, again, Taiwan has a lot of to share with uh, like-minded partners in these areas. And uh, we will go into more details, uh, and, and hopefully later I'll have the opportunity to share with you some of the concrete measures. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a, a perfect a springboard into Andras's uh, topic, and I know you've been researching this, so I turn to you with a question. How do security studies academics conceptualize uh, this uh, potential, you know, China-related threat escalation to Taiwan, something that His Excellency was also just outlining now, and how do you see it? You have five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Una, and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak here. Um, I would like to follow on with, with one mention uh, to the ambassador's uh, remarks that uh, we also had uh, a very interesting opinion uh, poll survey in Hungary during the summer uh, and they asked a lot of questions, it was done by Policy Solutions um, and uh, some of the questions pinpointed uh, issues for example such as what to do uh, in case um, something happens in the Taiwan Strait, how would the Hungarian public react to this or what were their preferences? And I'm sad to say that the Hungarian public is quite um, on the opposite side of the spectrum and I think uh, we, can, we can think about why. Uh, but to answer your question, most body of security studies literature and also policy analysis usually categorizes any potential for escalation into f three large groups. Uh, so um, the highest end of the spectrum is a full-scale invasion. Somewhere in between is a Chinese attack to grab outlying Taiwanese islands or offshore islands. Uh, I personally think that the most vulnerable or the most significant one would be the Penku Islands. Uh, and the third, so the less uh, escalatory one would be some form of blockade, so infringing on Taiwanese territorial sovereignty without the actual grab of uh, physical territory. Uh, we can see that in the last few years, um, increasing number of open source simulations, research, wargaming documentation have been published, uh, and the public is quite engaged with these researches. Fortunately, or I'm happy to say this, that there is uh, a media and public debate uh, on the results of such research. Um, I'm less, less happy to see that, for example, here in Hungary, uh, we see quite the misrepresentation of these researches and the findings of these simulations. So, for example, uh, last year there was a, a very comprehensive study done by CSIS on potential escalation in the Taiwan Strait, the involvement of the US. Uh, they did a wargaming number of iterations. Uh, and the main finding was that in, and usually this is uh, the main finding of most of these research, that in the midterm, so between the three to five years period, um, conventional military steps by China would not necessarily be successful. So there's a high rate of failure on the Chinese side. Also, given what is the configuration of the research or the simulation, there are instances where any intervening contingency, so for example the United States or Japan, suffers high number of casualties. Uh, when I looked at how, for example, Hungarian media reported on this research, uh, it was distorted in a way to mainly and only talk about Western or American casualties during a potential conflict. So uh, even in non um, government aligned media, even in independent media, the story, the thing that would catch the eye of the reader would be how much any intervening contingency would lose. 
Um, and I think this, uh, this has the added effect that it creates a climate within the public uh, that any sort of military support to Taiwan, which, which is a large part of the actual deterrent. Uh, so any sort of military support would be futile. Uh, and I think that the highest risk regarding this uh, phenomena is that in case of more likely scenarios, so when China doesn't necessarily engage in full-scale invasion, but looks for solutions that are somewhere in between, the public, and for example, Hungary is a good, good example of this, is already worked up to be depressed, to give up on the issue, uh, and this creates a climate which, uh, which is uh, sanctions or assertiveness avoidant of any Chinese action. So I think that's, that's the highest risk uh, that we can tangibly look at now uh, in the case study of the Hungarian public, uh, the misrepresentation of, of the open source research. Uh, that is being done, and it's good that it's being done. Uh, I just wish that uh, it would be represented in a more uh, comprehensive way. Thank you. Excellent. Now, Roland, let me turn to you to bring Europe into the conversation here. How would you assess the debate on, you know, democracy versus autocracy? Uh, the, this big, big meta debate in relations between China and the West, and. What is the role of, of the China threat in transatlantic relations? So if you can solve these issues in five minutes, we would be very thankful to you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Mission impossible. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I will, I will largely skip the second point. We can get back to transatlantic relations, but I will focus on the first one. Um, because I think it is really important to look at the meta-narratives here. Uh, I mean, we've had impressive uh, uh, presentations from, from the minister. Um, uh, and our, our Taiwanese colleague here uh, about disinfo from China and gen more generally authoritarian disinfo. I think it's worth to stop for a second and look at what is the big narrative behind that. Um, what are actually autocrats telling us? They're telling us that, um, you know, boys will be boys. Um, Great powers will be great powers. There have always been spheres of influence. Uh, people want stability. Uh, people don't want choice, really. Um, and um, that the idea of global, globally valid human rights and uh, liberal democracy is an aberration. You know, that was, that was like as if we were hippies from the 1970s. What we have to recognize is that autocrats think they own the future. Uh, that the 21st century belongs to them. And in fact, when we accuse them, you're stuck in the 19th century, they take it as a, as a compliment. Because they say that's, that's how politics really works. Um, and this is, this is from, you know, the, you, you discover elements of this from the Chinese Communist Party to Vladimir Putin, to Donald Trump, to Prime Minister Orban in this country. It's always what Tim Snyder calls the politics of eternity, right? Is that the word ultimately moves, history moves in circles, and we always remain the same. Now the other end of the spectrum is what Tim Snyder calls the politics of inevitability. In other words, there is one teleological movement to a different state of things. So out of necessity, humanity evolves to something else. Now, I would answer to both of these points, actually, with Ronald Reagan, who said that freedom is a fragile thing, and it is never more than a generation away from extinction. So yes, we can build a better world, and we have done so in the past, but this is no thing to take for granted. We have to defend it every day. And that brings me now to uh, uh, supporting Taiwan and the, the notion, uh, uh, which is hotly debated these days in the West, should we speak of a global confrontation between democracy and autocracy? 
I would just quote one, one uh, op-ed, uh, one essay actually, uh, of the end of 2021 by Anne Applebaum, The Bad Guys Are Winning. Excellent reading uh, uh, about Autocracy Incorporated and how the new wave of autocrats in the 21st century not only prop up each other in very existential ways, financially, technologically, militarily, but they also jointly undermine democracy because they define democracy by its very essence as an existential threat to their rule. And here we have the basic conflict. Now, does that mean that we divide the world into black and white, good and evil, um, uh, uh, liberal democracies and autocracies? No. I think there are, of course, nuances. One of the accusations against the democracy versus autocracy notion, of course, is that, hey, the West doesn't exist. You know, I mean, we, we, have, we have autocratic tendencies in the middle of the West, right here in this country, uh, but also in other EU member states. Um, we've got many regimes in the so-called Global South that do not completely fit into this autocracy versus democracy mold. And yet, therefore, I would define the, the Global West, not geographically speaking, but the Global West as a system of concentric circles, where in the middle you have liberal democracies, which are sometimes challenged from within, as in this country. But I mean, maybe we should even move away from, the, from, from naming countries and saying the core of this whole system is the global solidarity of Democrats. These are people. These are civil societies. These are organizations, uh, associations of people that have a common mindset. And uh, on the other hand, you have autocracies that definitely threaten democratic systems. And then a lot in between. Uh, and democ Democrats need to cooperate even with some autocracies as long as they don't undermine the West. Well, so much for my model of concentric circles which needs to resist the uh, authoritarian threat that expresses itself in uh, both uh, disinfo but also um, direct kinetic, as it goes, uh, kinetic violence, as we've seen over the past couple of days. And uh, this, this should be the background to the discussion about how we support Taiwan as a democracy against the authoritarian threat that it faces. Because ultimately, uh, the, the, for example, the, the question of um, Ukraine's defense against a dictatorship attacking the country, and Taiwan's resisting uh, threat from uh, the People's Republic of China are ultimately the same question. And I'll stop here. Uh, we can discuss uh, the transatlantic relation aspect later on. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you for bringing it home because this is perfect for Suja to uh, get in to the conversation. You are a common denominator of all the speakers before. You are a Central European living in Taiwan since 2020, if I'm not mistaken. You are also uh, a, a European who is based, who has an affiliation in Brussels, so you're very well adjusted to the to the Brussels debate on the issue, and also on the where do we stand on the cooperation with autocracy, something that Roland very elegantly just outlined in terms of dilemmas and solutions. So I, I, I would just like to ask you, what is your assessment of, of how the EU is adjusting, or not, perhaps, uh, to an assertive China? And also, you were taking a lot of notes there, so if you have any reactions to the previous speakers, feel, please feel free to also do them in your five minutes. Thank you, Una. Thank you so much for moderating this discussion, and thank you for the organizers to, for um, having us here. I think it's great that we're having this conversation about China and Taiwan also across Europe, not just in the places that we're used to having them, as you mentioned, Brussels. Um, so I think what I will try to do in the few minutes that I have is to really give an overview of how I see it on the ground as a European uh, living in Taiwan for the past three years. Um, and so I would like to make uh, one main argument that I would 
elaborate on is that we are clearly in a new reality. And that reality is being shaped uh, to a great extent by the way how authoritarian regimes use information and disinformation and manipulate information uh, together supported by economic coercion. And I would say that these two elements are the two sides of the same coin. And the way they shape the new debate uh, is how we have to face this new reality. And I believe strongly that the European Union is in the process of adjusting to this new reality. And this is perhaps the first positive uh, message that I would have that I can confidently say. And um, I think we can observe, and this is what I've been observing inside Taiwan, that the EU is adjusting. Now, that means, in my view, that we are building up a defense against authoritarian threats, uh, both in the political and in the economic uh, field. So that means de-risking. Perhaps this is not um, a term that everyone likes, but I think it is important because it sort of captures what we're trying to do, is to reduce dependencies in strategic areas that we are too vulnerable and exposed to uh, China, but also to the China-Russia strategic cooperation that we've seen build up uh, even more since um, Russia's renewed aggression against Ukraine. So we have defensive tools, and we're working on that tool set. Uh, but we also need to be mindful that I think the most important uh, thing that we should be doing going forward is to strengthen alliances. So that builds on what uh, my distinguished panelists already talked about, is that at the core of how we build up a democratic alliance is to really start with the practical things. So how do we actually work together? Do we understand the narrative? And I think that's the first thing that we need to talk about inside Europe. What are the elements of China's uh, global agenda when it comes to shaping the narrative? Um, and how do we counter that? So I think being on the defense, and that's sort of the, the second part of my argument, that it is great and it, we're doing it, we're de-risking, it takes time, especially in the European context, it will take time because we're 27 countries and uh, within the countries we have even more fragmentation, so we need to be aware of that, that's, but that's the reality. And we're working with it, but it is not sufficient to be on the defense. So we need to really be proactive and we need to have that strategic vision, but also the, the concrete um, plan and agenda of how do we work together with Taiwan. So that's the note I was taking down, why Taiwan matters and why for, for Europe Taiwan matters. And I think in the three years, and I would really talk about three years because as you, we all know, it is in 2020 that the world started the, to face the pandemic. And I think that was the first bigger um, moment in EU-Taiwan relations as well that things started to change. Taiwan was elevated on Europe's agenda and it remains there. There is no, in the European context, let's say in the institutional level in the EU, there is no foreign policy debate today in the EU that doesn't have Taiwan in it. This was not the case three years ago. And this is all positive. So I. You know, I'm trying to be realistic, but I think it's also good to, to look at what we've done, not just at what we are not doing. So that's perhaps more on the positive side. Um, and so to come to an end, because I think that's pretty much my five minutes here, but I can uh, continue later uh, in the Q&A. What does it mean to have a counter narrative is first to work closely with like-minded partners such as Taiwan, but also to go even beyond into the global, as Roland was saying. I think we need to work with countries in the global south much more closely, <laughs> developing countries, whether we like that term as the global south or not, that's a different debate. Debate, but I think developing countries are exposed and uh, vulnerable to the sort of disinformation and economic coercion that uh, authoritarian regimes use to undermine democracy, to discredit democratic governance. So I think uh, there I'm perhaps not as optimistic yet because I think we are only now having this conversation that the global south matters and that matters in particular in light of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've seen how the, the world has reacted or not to that. So um, I am looking forward. I think Taiwan, and again, I'm optimistic here. I trust that there is no turning back, 
Taiwan will not go down on Europe's agenda. But I think in this conversation, I think we need to talk with Taiwan, not just about Taiwan. So what will happen after the elections in Taiwan? Uh, in next year will be also very important because there's two sides in this conversation and I think the last note is that Taiwan has its own agency and I think a lot of the conversation excludes that so I hope we can build on that conversation and I look forward to other engagements here. Thank you. So indeed, we have been moving from outlining the issues, the challenging towards already talking about the positive examples and solutions. And there's no one better who, to talk about an example of pushing back than TT Cat or uh, Min Chuan Wu, who is with us here today. Who is, uh, is you've probably read stuff that Double Think Lab has been putting out since I think you've been active since 2019, something like that. So at least I know I have. And please take it away. How how have you been working, and how do you react to what the colleagues have been saying in terms of hybrid threats, and what are the solutions here, and what is your outlook? All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Titikat. Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor to participate in this dialogue. Um, Double Think Lab has been started in 2019, and we mainly focus on uh, China influence operation uh, around the globe, and as well as the disinformation campaign, information operation online. Um, just give you one like a uh, concept here. Uh, why I'm um, coming to uh, Hungary? This is my first time to be in this country. Uh, Taiwan have a 23 million people, so it's kind of like uh, maybe twice bigger uh, than the population here. Uh, but we only have like in size of the land is only like one third of the um, Hungarian. Um, we've been talked of. We've been living from the um, decades uh, under the China's narrative. It's sort of like a Russia to Ukraine that we are a small country, and you are um, like a very small brother, and we have shared the same root and the ethnic and blood, everything uh, like that. Um, um, but actually, Taiwan is uh, in relative concept is not always as a small countries. Taiwan threat, why does it matter? Taiwan threat has like a, um, the whole world, like 50% of the cargo shipping uh, is crossing the Taiwan ship uh, straight. So if there's a, a war happen, um, that will uh, uh, hugely impact the whole world economy uh, for no doubts. Um, the reason we are looking at the uh, disinformation um, uh, from, the, from the China to Taiwan is not only because it's an existential uh, threat to our um, democracy and existence, but also um, I would I would say that it's the biggest the, the biggest lies and the disinformation in the world is the one China policy. It's a Taiwan belong to China. So uh, if you, in case you didn't know that in 2018. Um, China forced like most of the airline company in the world to change tai Taipei Taiwan as a Taipei China on their website. And they said it very vague, it's like if you don't change that you will face uh, serious uh, consequences. And the most of the airline company change um, uh, only unless, uh, I think the only US uh, airline under the State Department um, uh, issue a order so they didn't change. But the most of the airline company changed. So so next time if you want to visit Taiwan, uh, don't apply the visa from China. Uh, remember that. Um, even, the, uh, uh, even on your ticket or on the airline uh, website says Taipei, China. But uh, we have our own government. We have our own currency. We have our own military and everything. So it's a totally um, one, like a, you know, de facto countries, uh, like a, uh, just like a Hungary or like a Ukraine. It's a democratic country. So we have have an election. Um, so, but why a lot of a country are compiled to this one China policy or to uh, deny a Taiwan as a nation or um, is out of the fear or out of the threat from the China, uh, out of a business interest or other things? So, um, 
Um, we visited Ukraine and also start from the world. We are um, we are looking at how China government and their state media propagated those disinformation, replicated the Russian narrative and push it online from their state media or on their social media platform like TikTok, Douyin, or Weibo, or WeChat, and we found there's a lot of similarities um, for the Russian narrative and the China narrative. They all speak for the same um, uh, narrative like. Um, uh, this is a, a proxy war from the uh, U.S. and this is a Western uh, countries' fault. Uh, Ukraine just a pop um, a pump, uh, be used by the Western countries, and also this is uh, um, there's a lot of uh, um, 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 uh, conspiracy behind. Um, so as how China uh, be talking to to us, um, I think that our minister um, give it a very good example. So we are looking at like more cooperation. Um, I know there is a debate uh, in especially in U.S. that uh, supporting Ukraine, that whether that will um, whether supporting Ukraine or supporting Taiwan, and we don't see that as a competition here. Um, I think there is more cooperation because our enemies and our adversary, they are working together. They are sharing the same tactic and playbook. Um, give you another example that um, last year, uh, there's a polling company, they do the global polling, and then they ask a major country in the world that uh, who you think should be blamed for the Ukrainian war. Right, and most of the country, of course, they say uh, Russia, um, like um, uh, you, Japan or UK. But in China, um, more than 50 percent of the people think that is a U.S. fault, and the number second is NATO. They think that a Russian, um, like very few people think it is uh, Russia's fault um, or Ukrainian fault, right? So you can um, imagine that, uh, assuming that um, those propaganda from the Russia, they are not only propagating in Russia or Ukraine, but also here, also in Turkey or Germany or other places. So you can assume that when something happened from the China, they probably uh, adopting the synthetic. They will talk to you guys like, um, well, Taiwan is not that innocent. It's a U.S. fault. Right? Right? So it's uh, uh, U.S. is behind. This is nothing to do with the EU. Um, if you watch closely, like Mahom, um, he also um, state that um, a few months ago that um, this is not a European problem, uh, that, like Taiwan. So. Um, I would say, um, in the end, I would say that uh, for the solution. So we are looking at um, not like a fact-checking initiative. We work with a lot of a fact-checking initiative, but we are looking at the uh, behavior, like a cyber troop, how they do the information operation, how they uh, use a fake account or certain tactic to uh, create this illusion that uh, a lot of people uh, actually care or have this share the same narrative online. So. Um, I think that a lot of international organization right now is talking about the propaganda in the wartime as a weapon um, and uh, how we define that. And uh, I, think, I think essentially we are looking at the propaganda um, or the, any technique that is uh, misleading people at scale and be used uh, for um, their war as a weapon. And for assisting those uh, propaganda, uh, social media or new technology like uh, um, generative AI has become a huge um, component here and uh, huge actors here. And also like marketing industry. And those like social media, AI tech and uh, uh, marketing industry could be uh, certainly um, restricted by the um, uh, certain policy and the policy that um, should strengthen um, the education for the truth and for people um, to, um, um, for the information integrity and so on. So for those kind of a policy um, is what we are interested to uh, discover um, and I'm looking forward for more discussion here. Thank you. Thank you. And now I think we have to start with the Q&A because there are so many threads here in the conversation to poll. We will be pooling the questions. Please raise your hand. And sir, thank you for getting the ball rolling. Petru Lignac from, from NATO. Um, many thanks. Fascinating, uh, fascinating, you know, uh, interventions. Um, I was just wondering, uh, perhaps my question is, is to everyone, but perhaps to Mr. Wu, because I was uh, intrigued by your, uh, by your presentation. But my, my impression was that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, that you sort of uh, um, suggested a possible sort of even 
official cooperation or sort of coordination between between Russia and and the People's Republic of, of, of China in terms of in terms of narratives um, I have to admit and if I misunderstood um, apologies but in fact our our analysis because we have been sort of following that as well you know the uh, uh, analyzing information and information environment is that despite the overlap of narratives you know uh, which come which, which originate in what what Roland you know uh, called meta narrative you know basically the same worldview. Actually, we don't see any any evidence of of official sort of you know uh, I'm not saying formal but sort of coordination that it's really it's really something sp almost I wouldn't say spontaneous but obviously you know very uh, something reflecting uh, reflecting the the worldview rather than rather than sort of uh, some sort of uh, some sort of uh, coordination. That would be my first uh, question and second question perhaps to, to uh, both uh, Taiwanese colleagues is what actually do what do you what do how do you address uh, uh, you know uh, more specifically these uh, these um, uh, these challenges because of course the the um, uh, the the immediate temptation is always to to respond to every single piece of lie um, misinformation which is something that that how we started a few years ago you know um, and then we sort of realized that if you do that you will end up only doing only that. Um, so we sort of took a step back and, and decided, well, you know, let's not be manipulated on sort of into the, that kind of posture all the time. Let's have our story, our narrative. Let's follow and analyze the information environment, but let's not be sort of, um, you know, drawn into this constant debunking of lies and, and nonsense. Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw a hand there, gentleman in the green shirt. Uh, thank you. And to the same direction, I was wondering whether it makes sense to differentiate between disinformation originating from Russia and disinformation originating from the People's Republic in China, and what we could learn in terms of methods, like other ways how this information is spread and framed, different when it comes from Russia than when it comes from the People's Republic of China, um, especially when I think about in how absurd narratives emanating in Russian state media actually are, and maybe there's more need for like, I don't know, coherence and actually like sort of um, understandable arguments in the Chinese public space. It's just something I wonder about if there's a differentiation to be made there. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, sir. The gentleman in the third row. Third row. Hello. Oh. He okay. Has very, the mic quickly, has the this first question hand. is for uh, His, His Excellency and Mr. Uh, Wu. We're talking over here about an incredibly profound national security issue in disinformation, and I'm wondering: uh, have your governments, have your uh, your projects, um, sought the cooperation of companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and to what extent are they transparent with you about the reach? Um, you know, polarity, so on, so on, so on, of the data that they're looking at, because we have a problem in the United States with this. Uh, we, we're not really seeing that, but in, in this particular case, it's, it, it would seem as though uh, there would certainly be grounds for collaboration. I'm just wondering whether you guys have any experience with that. Thank you. We're running out of time, but I do owe you uh, a, a, a short question slot, nonetheless. Please. Thank you, Heinrich Kraft and Russia University. Um, about the uh, organization of the disinformation, we have a, a little idea what uh, how it, uh, it it's working in Russia with uh, the troll factory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how is it organized in China? Uh, do we have an idea? Is it is it uh, the PLA? Is it the state media? Who who is behind it? Who is how is it organized? Or are there many uh, individuals, private companies involved as well? Uh, the organizers have just granted us a respite of an extra 15 minutes, which is great news because these questions are very, very much in depth. Now, let's uh, close off the first round here and see how we do on time. I will start then with uh, TT Cat, and because most of the questions have been addressed to you, but dear colleagues, please do not let that keep you from responding as well. Please. Right. So, <clears throat> first, 
evident for the um, Russia and the PRC cooperation. So to, uh, start from the 2015, Russia today signed the agreement with the major state media in, in China. So they start to sharing and uh, uh, translating each other's. There's a one particular case that we found last year is the in 2019, there's a story from the Russia uh, media, uh, small media, saying that a uh, few Ukrainian went to the uh, Hong Kong and they are CIA funded Ukrainian Nazi and they started a whole rally in the Hong Kong. That bizarre um, story immediately trans uh, translated by the Global Times and propagated um, start from the 2019 as the evidence that the U.S. is behind the uh, Hong Kong protest. And the last year, of course, they recycle this news. So they start to recycle this news and they say uh, it's caught by the Russia media. And the Russia media also cited and say, oh, this is cited by China media. So in terms of the governmental uh, corroboration, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's hard to prove by the open source intelligence. But from our daily uh, observation, like a day by day start from the war uh, for the hundred days, we see they translate everything from each other or they citing each other's. For example, that when Putin make his speech on the uh, last February, there's a war by war translation transcription uh, immediately published in one hour on the Weibo and be uh, spreading all around the uh, Chinese speaking uh, information space. But for the uh, Russia, for the uh, when Zelensky made his like famous speech in the EU, uh, there's just a very short uh, brief uh, news in the uh, China, so or China information space because China information space is also highly censorship. Uh, highly controlled all the narrative. Um, so that's why their propaganda is so powerful. So for um, the Facebook and the Twitter and the Google, the questions, uh, yes, they are um, uh, sort of, a, uh, well, Twitter, Twitter basically out of this uh, game. Uh, they basically fire everyone um, to do the information operations study, especially for those uh, study the Chinese information operations, uh, which is a shame. Um, then uh, Google is keeping up uh, and Facebook is really, um, I think it in the context of the China uh, information operation, they are really, really delegated their resource to do such an investigation. Uh, not to mention they hired the, uh, Ben Nemo from the graphic card, now become their head of the info, uh, security um, investigation team. Right, and then uh, for the actors, uh, for the adversary. So um, the adversary part is, uh, we are talking about widely uh, different actors. There is a business driven or political driven. Uh, a few years ago, we published a report, it's called Defending Whisper. Uh, our uh, experts, our trip person, they, they, they uh, sort of like map out the different actors and the motivation uh, behind. Some is from the POA, yes, and some is from the um, different like marketing firms or uh, other 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 um, sectors. Um, so um, I would love to give like one comparison. Um, I I I grew up as an activist. Um, my um, few years ago, I was the activist for uh, anti-nuclear um, uh, and affiliate with the Taiwan Green Party and also the German. Um, the first time I went to the Berlin is hosted by the uh, foundation here. Um, so uh, in the in the whole nuclear argument, there is a one particular argument I would like to compare is that we all know that the, the radiation can, um, can, can damage your cell and uh, to cause the cancer if you put that on the lab. But for the people who live around the nuclear west or nuclear power plant, you cannot prove that their disease or whatever the cancer they have is actually contributed by the nuclear. It's very, very hard. And so as I, so we see a lot of a tremendous amount of the disinformation flow into Taiwan and uh, lew out all the possibility of a motivation. Only one adversary has the uh, uh, motivation to propagate those stuff and the delicate resource. So we're only looking at the disinformation campaign that indicates that somebody paying a lot of money or resource uh, behind. It's not done by some volunteers or you know some neighbors who have a different opinion with you. Not only that, they have a resource, they have a machine, they have technology and a lot of uh, um, 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 actors there. So we've been looking at that, but uh, unfortunately to prove um, that which disinformation is actually attributed from the POA or from another department is nearly impossible from um, our, our, our space, yes. 
Yes, uh, please, uh, Your Excellency, because there was also a question how to address these challenges, right? So maybe you Yes, let me just answer a couple of them. Um, let's give you one last, one latest example. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, one Taiwanese newspaper did a scoop saying that the U.S. government and Taiwan government are cooperating in developing biochemical weapon. Okay? And of course, our government denied that. And then the, the, the newspaper ended up apologizing to its readers for not verifying the source of this news. So it was a fake news. Mm -hmm. However, you know, the, what the Chinese uh, in, uh, intention in Taiwan to spread in those fake news has become more of a, what I call one-stop production line. So one specific newspaper spreading out this, uh, this fake news, and then the pro-China politicians or media in Taiwan, they pick up that subject and keep feigning the flame. And then the third stage goes back to Chinese media, saying that, see, the current Taiwan government and the US government are working together to develop biochemical weapon to the uh, uh, Chinese people and Taiwanese people. So this is a classical one. Another example, um, again, this is from uh, what some uh, uh, agents, Chinese uh, supported agency in Taiwan, saying that if China attacks Taiwan, the US government will blow up the TSMC, Taiwan Telecommunication, uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, one of the world's biggest chip making company. They keep their most advanced technology in Taiwan. So the fake news goes like, okay, if China attacks Taiwan, US will blow up the TSMC to avoid TSMT, TSMC falling into China's hand, which of course proved Again, it's a total uh, of fake news. So those examples, I mean, going back to the young gentleman's earlier questions, of course, Russian disinformation, misinformation, uh, slightly different from Chinese one, but they are learning from each other. You know, language is not a barrier. I mean, it will all come to the same. In, in Taiwan's case, like I say, it has become more of a one-stop production line. And there are a lot of collaborators, a lot of agencies involved in that, media too. So, so just be, oh, we need, of course, media discipline, we need uh, longer term, we need uh, uh, fact-checking, we need uh, media literacy, we need uh, some kind of a necessary legislation. So I, I just wanted to uh, add up one point uh, raised by Andreas earlier. It's very, very important. I, I just read a, a, a recent polling conducted by the Global Stack based in Bratislava recently. It was more about a, a V4 country. How, how are V4 people perceive China and Taiwan? And there are two findings that are very interesting to me. One is that uh, apparently, there is a huge lack of uh, understanding among V4 countries and, and their people on Taiwan. Czech, Czechia is better. I mean, more than 50% of the people in Czechia, they know about Taiwan. In Hungary, it's like 33, 34. In Poland and in, in, in Slovakia, the number are, again, less than 40%. Which means, um, this is my job here, is to hopefully to, uh, to, to, to make uh, more Hungarian people know about Taiwan. Another question is about Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Again, in, in Hungary, despite how close Hungary's relationship is with China, only like 30-some percent of Hungarian people know about Xi Jinping, a dictatorship. This is interesting, right? So, um, and also another question is about uh, how people in, in the V4 perceive a possible war in, in Taiwan Straits. Again, I, I have to say it clearly. Um, and I also wanted to remind you of what the, the late Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said. A Taiwan contingency is a Japan contingency. He was referring to a possible Chinese military attack on Taiwan and its disastrous, disastrous impact on Japan. I would, I, I would say that a Taiwan contingency is more than just a Japan contingency. It's a, it's a Korean contingency. It's, it's a Philippine contingency. It's a global contingency. Given the fact that Taiwan is a, is a, is a beacon of democracy, Taiwan is a, is a game changer in global chip making. The TSMC, the company, accounts for 90% of advanced uh, 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 chips in, uh, in, in global market. So Taiwan does not want to have war with China, but Taiwan needs to be prepared for a war with China in order to avoid a war with China. 
And this is what we do uh, in the past few years, uh, introducing more ref military reform to strengthen our uh, social and defense resilience uh, to possible Chinese attack and also to uh, the Chinese launch disinformation warfare on Taiwan. It, and Ch Taiwan's people have been watching very closely uh, the, how resilient the Ukrainian people are when facing the Russian invasion. So this is something that Taiwanese wanted to share with our friends uh, in Hungary and also in Europe. Thank you, Your Excellency. Wonderful. Now, Shuja, you want to react, please? Yes, thank you. I wanted to react immediately um, to what uh, Ambassador Lu, Lu said uh, earlier about the lack of understanding. And I think that's very much uh, the reason why there is space for disinformation and information manipulation. And I'd like to con uh, connect that with uh, what Titi Kat, you said about the One China principle versus One China policy. Um, and I think that's a very good example of how we fail ourselves in our own societies and we allow that space for Beijing to impose their one China principle and I'm sure everyone in this room knows but perhaps not and it's a confusing sort of uh, and very subtle kind of uh, case between the principle and policy so allow me to just be very brief on that but according to the one China principle that Beijing imposes is that there's one China and Taiwan is part of China. According to the one China policy that the EU has and different democratic countries have is that we recognize the PRC as the sole legal government of China and we maintain the right to cooperate with Taiwan. And I think this is very important because you see the two are completely different things. And what happens is that when a country such as Lithuania decides to reduce its cooperation with China and turn towards Taiwan in a pro-democracy, not in an anti-China move, I think that's an also very important point, China's reaction is, obviously, we know it, is to correct its mistake, quote unquote, but also to say and to um, you know, use that widely, that Lithuania's decision to um, cooperate with uh, Taiwan is a violation of the One China Principle. This is misinformation because Lithuania does not subscribe to the One China Principle. Lithuania's One China Policy allows Lithuania to have the right to cooperate as a sovereign country with uh, Taiwan. So, this is, I think, a very good example. I, used, I usually use that also in, in my teaching uh, in Taiwan, that we need to make sure that we understand what we're dealing with. And um, also, another point I wanted to, again, to, as I said earlier, you know, there's a lot that we have to do, but there's a lot that we're already doing. And I also want to turn again to what we're doing in terms of the European Union. We have, since 2015, the External Action Service is um, work on understanding, uh, debunking, <coughs> excuse me, and preparing against disinformation in the STRATCOM, the Strategic Communication Department and Unit. We also have a China team and they do excellent work. And again, because I'm based in Taiwan, actually I do use that material in my teaching, um, as teaching material to debunk the myths on Russia, Ukraine to a Taiwanese audience. And that's where I link, again, that a Taiwanese contingency is a Japanese and global contingency. I think we really need to approach it from this perspective. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Andras, would you like to pick up on some of those points and questions? Yes, thank you. Just, just two very short comments. Um, I'm not a research expert on, on comparative disinformation. My expertise in, is in security studies, but I can tell what I, I see in, in the Hungarian media sphere. Uh, and I think, at least on, based on this case study, uh, we should highlight that there is a difference in style on, on Russian disinformation and Chinese, uh, I would call it narratives. Uh, when we look at uh, CGTV, Hungarian version on Facebook, or when we look at certain like, Telegram channels, uh, I think a very important aspect is that in the Russian uh, version, you see a lot of falsehoods being pushed forward. Uh, and the Chinese style, at least in Hungarian language, is less about spreading falsehood. It's more about not talking about certain issues and presenting a very distortedly positive uh, way about, about the China-friendly narratives. Um, and 
I think that one uh, one example on this uh, this case that can bring us back to what can we do uh, is sometimes Hungarian experts will go into TV and talk to reporters and and uh, journalists. And they ask the question. The journalist would ask, uh, "What is the, uh, what does the Ukraine war teach us about a potential Chinese uh, Taiwanese contingency?" Uh, and in some cases, the answer will be nothing because. Uh, the person would say that China and Taiwan, it's an internal issue. So you cannot compare an interstate war uh, with an internal issue. And I think a lot of the time, the reason that Chinese narratives are effective, uh, I'm sorry this might not be polite, is because of intellectual laziness on the part of the media. We have a couple of representatives from uh, news outlets here. Um, it's not a secret that Taiwan has its own army. It's not a secret that Taiwan has its own government. It's two clicks on Google. When an expert tells you that, uh, or any, or a spokesperson from China, or anyone, or you just highlight an article that said such, uh, it's it's not disinformation, or it, it's not a lie. You can Google that Taiwan has its own army. So when you ask the question, what the Ukrainian war teaches Taiwan about war, potential war with China, and you get the an answer, nothing, because it's an internal issue, as a journalist, as a representative of media, I'm sorry, you have to be smarter than that. You have to follow up with the next question, okay, but what about the 200,000 personal army of Taiwan? What about the two million reservists? What about this and that? So that's, you know, we have to do a better job than that, or at least uh, we should do a better job than that. Um, and I think I'm very happy that uh, Japan was mentioned. Um, there was also a lack of awareness in at least the Hungarian media, but I think the general European uh, public sphere, uh, that East Asia is not just China and the rest. There are countries surrounding China. They have peculiar relationships with China and they do have a lot of agency on what happens in the security complex of East Asia and for example Japan is a very substantial naval uh, player in East Asia uh, but to the best of my experience, uh, East Asian countries, at least in the Hungarian public sphere, but probably on, in Europe as a whole, are not necessarily comfortable in presenting themselves as, uh, as security players, as providers of security. Uh, I think that probably our East Asian partners can help us have a better understanding of East Asia if they don't shy away from presenting themselves as a net provider of regional stability. Uh, and I think uh, South Korea currently is doing a very excellent job at that. Uh, I would be very happy to see uh, Japanese colleagues joining this sort of uh, narrative campaign to show European publics and show the Hungarian public that, for example, Japan has almost as many number of destroyers of China, the strong Chinese Navy. Uh, cultural programs and, and re representing elements of, uh, for example, Japanese cuisine are very interesting and very important. Uh, but I think at these times we do need our East Asian like-minded partners to show us that they are actually strong providers of regional stability. Thank you. And the burden falls on you, Roland, to bring us home. Indeed. I, uh, I want to actually uh, go back to something Zhuja said uh, about decoupling. Because, you know, we, I think it's worth thinking at the end of this debate about, a little bit about the response. I mean, and not only response in terms of counter disinfo, but also generally what do Democrats do as a reaction to the threat by autocrats? Uh, de risking. Sounds great, sounds totally logical, but here's my spoiler. If de-risking is limited to improving our supply chains in a couple of areas such as pharmaceuticals or rare earths or other raw materials, that doesn't cut the ice. Um, and I totally understand why, for example, Commission President von der Leyen in her seminal speech earlier this year uh, 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 about de-risking 
had to say that we don't want to decouple. I, I, I recognize the political expediency of that, right? But honestly, if we're serious about de-risking, we will have to broadly disengage economically from, I mean, we've done it with Russia to a great extent, we will have to do it with China. Whether you use the, use the word decoupling or disengagement, whatever. But, you know, Taiwan's go south strategy is a clear reaction to the recognition that the Taiwanese economy is highly dependent on Chinese markets, right? And we need to change that. We need to do something about it. That means diversification. I mean, look at Germany's car makers and how they, I mean, they're like junkies on cold turkey when thinking about what China might do to their, to their export markets. Um, that is dependency, and we want to re reduce that dependency. We need to, unfortunately, reduce our economic interaction. It doesn't mean we're not going to buy T-shirts anymore from China, but, but there will be, there will be some, some kind of economic disengagement, and we have to be clear about this. And this is my final word. This is perfect because the next panel is exactly about that economy. Coffee break, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.